There we are, we're on. Good. <laughs> so welcome to our service this morning. My name is Paul. I am one of the visiting chaplains here. Don't get here as much as I used to, uh, but it's good to be back this morning and to share with you. And uh, it's also good to have Stephen with us again, playing for us. And unfortunately, I missed the Thanksgiving day on Saturday. I don't know how many were here on Saturday for the Thanksgiving Day, just a few. Well, the Thanksgiving's still continuing, all the banners and all the balloons, and uh, our service this morning will also be a service of Thanksgiving. Welcome to those who are joining us online. Uh, it's good to have you with us. And I'm going to start in a minute with a few verses from Psalm 125. Before I do that, could I ask how many of you come from an Anglican church background? Well, Anglican church worship, yeah. Well, in the liturgy in the Anglican church, often we have at the beginning of the service an invitation which says, the Lord is here, and the response is, his spirit is with us. And sometimes when I'm taking a service in some Anglican churches, I start off very enthusiastically and I say, the Lord is here. And then you get this mumble from the pews, you know, his spirit is with us. <laughs> yeah, really? Do we really believe it? That when we meet to worship, his spirit is with us. So the Lord is here. I'll take you to the next service I'm doing in an Anglican church. <laughs> so a few verses from Psalm 1 to 5. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. Two wonderful verses which assure us of the Lord's continuing presence with us through his Holy Spirit. So before we sing our first hymn, which is a hymn in which we have come to worship uh, the Lord, I want us to be quiet just for a few moments. We've just said the Lord is here, his spirit is with us. So let's just be relaxed in his presence. Close your eyes if you want. Raise your hands. Let's just be quiet in the assurance that we are here in the presence of the Lord. His spirit is in this place. So in that silence, let us remember that we are in the company of the Lord. We can let all our attention go because we are completely safe. Let us relax in the arms of the one 
who knows us, who loves us. So we sing together, we have come into his house to worship him. Is all my righteousness. I stand complete in him and worship him. He is all my righteousness. I stand complete in him and worship him. Worship Christ the Lord. So feel free to offer prayers of thanksgiving and worship to the Lord for his love and all he has done for us so that we can stand complete in him either quietly or out loud Thank you, Lord, for lifting Josh down and letting him stand so much better. 
Amen. So we worship and we praise you and we thank you, Lord. We are so indebted to this great love poured upon us. Lord, we have just sung, we lift up holy hands. And Lord, we lift ourselves. We lift our hearts to you this morning. And worship you. Amen. Please be seated. I read those uh, verses from Psalm 125, and when I read them, I realized that um, just a couple of psalms later on, there's Psalm 128, blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in his ways. <clears throat> We're going to be thinking about that uh, a bit later on, not necessarily that psalm, but that psalm is very special to us, Psalm 128 because it was the psalm that was used uh, by the one who was preaching at our wedding service 54 years ago. And uh, he was a fellow curate who had a wicked sense of humor. And he chose this psalm to preach at our wedding. And if I tell you that my wife's name is Olive, you'll realize what his sense of humor was like, because this is what it says. Blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in his ways. You will eat the fruit of your labor. Blessings and prosperity be, will be yours. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your sons will be like olive shoots round your table. <laughs> well, we have two sons and a daughter. <laughs> and we thank God for them. Um, but I, I couldn't help just flick to that psalm um, after I read Psalm 125. So let's sing, Light of the World, You Step Down into Darkness. 1419, Light of the World, You Stepped Down into Darkness. Isn't it wonderful? This great God who comes to where we are meets us where we are, who came in Christ so that we could come to him. 1419.
Please be seated. I've chosen for our reading this morning some verses from Galatians. And um, I think they'll be very well-known verses to most of you. You could probably say them off by heart. Galatians chapter 5. And we're just going to read verses 16 to 18 and 22 to 25. So I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under law. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. I think it's commonly known that love really is the fruit of the Spirit and encompassed in love all those other fruits, the joy, the peace, the patience. But love, if you like, is the... Is the um, the one that holds all together. Gentleness and self-control against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step <clears throat> with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. So Lord, we thank you for these verses. We thank you for all that you pour into our lives through your grace and through your love, for the way in which you mold us into the people that you want us to be, into the likeness of Christ. So guide us now as we think together and share our thoughts above all. Help us to be open to all that you long to share with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. As I said, I think that's one of probably the most well-known and loved passages, the fruits of the Spirit. It's often linked with John chapter 15, where Jesus said that he is the vine and we are the branches. And that's a wonderful illustration that Jesus used of the uh, life of the vine flowing into the branches and from the branches producing the fruits. It's interesting in that illustration of the fruit and the vine, Jesus uses the, the one word abide. In some Bibles it says remain, abide in me, remain in me. Uses it about 10 times in just the first 10 verses. And for me that's... Uh, a, a very important point to remember. Important reflection. Ten times in ten verses, remain in me, abide in me, and you will bear much fruit. I think it was possibly the writer to the Galatians that was thinking about that illustration that Jesus had used. Maybe he was when he wrote these words about the fruits of the Spirit. You know, the New Testament talks about the gifts of the Spirit, which are for ministry and for service. And we all know about the gifts of the Spirit, 
gifts of healing, administration, gifts of um, preaching, of prophecy, and so on. But the fruits of the Spirit are very distinct from the gifts of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit are given so that we may serve and minister to each other, or that Christ through us and his Holy Spirit can minister to each other. But the fruits of the Spirit are about what Jesus is doing in our lives through the Holy Spirit, changing us into his likeness so that we reflect his love and his presence here in the world. So the fruits of the Spirit about Christ in me, being changed by the Holy Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is love. I said love, if you like, sums everything else up. Encapsulated in the love of Christ in our hearts is what happens as our lives become changed. And the first three, love, joy, and peace, are what we experience in our relationship with Jesus. The love, the joy, and the peace. The difference that we experience in our walk with Christ from what we had before. But the rest of those fruits are about our relationships with other people. The kindness, the goodness, the gentleness, and self-control, and so on. And I love that illustration of the vine and that beautiful cluster of grapes and all the fruits of the Spirit. And the fact that Jesus said, abide in me, remain in me. If anyone remains in me and I in them, he will bear much fruit. Remain, abide, ten times in just ten verses. But we often miss the verse that comes after these. The verse that comes after in Galatians says, if we live by the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. And that's what I want us to think about this morning. What does it mean to live by the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit? And that's the verse that's often overlooked when we focus on the fruits of the Spirit. You know, I love the uh, story about the mother who was watching her son, um, who was in a passing out parade um, in the army cadets. And they were all marching past, and suddenly there was this loud voice of the mother said, proud voice of the mother who said, look, they're all out of step except my son. <laughs> Keep in step with the Spirit. If we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. You know, the Greek language is very rich. And in the Greek language, there are very different words for just this one word, walk. I think if you look in the AV versions, it says live by the Spirit. But our versions say walk in the spirit and that's the nearer translation of the greek word i'm not a greek scholar but I do, I do know that there are different words for the word walk there's a word which means to roam around and just to meander around and to ramble around it's the word we get perambulate from have you ever heard that word perambulate that's where we get that word from there's a word which means to walk through, like walking through a wood. Not a stopping place, you're just on a journey somewhere, or a ship leaving the port. There's a word which means we are walking in a straight line. Rather like, um, like the soldier walking in a straight line is the word we get orthopedic from. Because of the orthopedic surgeons in the business of making things straight again. 
So all these different words, but the word that's used here in Galatians is very, very different. When the writer says walk in the spirit, he chose a very distinct word. And it was a word which was about our relationships. It was a word which means walking alongside with someone else. Walking alongside um, with your wife or your husband or your friend. It means walking in companionship with someone else. It was always about relationships. What an important word he used to talk about walking in the spirit. Walking in the spirit means we are walking with Christ. Christ is walking with us. I want us to think about this this morning. You know, way back in the Old Testament in Leviticus, we have that wonderful um, verse from Leviticus 26. The promise of God to Israel, I will walk among you, I will be your God, and you will be my people. I find that an awesome verse. I will walk among you and be your God, and you will be my people. God chooses to share himself with us in that way. And then, of course, in Christ and through the Holy Spirit, we realize the importance of that. And so Isaiah, when he's writing, says, come. That's what God's promise is. I will walk with you, among you, and be your God. You will be my people. You will be my beloved child, if you like. And Isaiah said, in view of that, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord an invitation. Come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. What does it mean to keep in step with the Spirit? Well, I guess you could all give your different answers to that. Is it about gritting our teeth (laughs) and giving it all we've got? You know, we've got to pray more, we've got to focus our efforts more, we've got to be stronger in our witness and so on. I don't think it's about gritting our teeth at all. I think it's about learning to rest in Jesus and all that we have in him. Learning to rest in who he is and allow him to be at work in our lives. So often we become inward looking, don't we? You know, I'm not praying as I should. Oh, I didn't pray as long as I should have done this morning. It was too rushed. I had to get out and so on. Oh, I wish I could have more time to study the word and so on. Why wasn't I a stronger witness when I was talking with that person? And then perhaps when we fail ourselves, so easy to become discouraged. We carry weights upon our shoulders, weights which speak of guilt from the past, which weigh us down as we journey on. Yet Jesus said, I have come that they might have life in all its fullness. It's very different from gritting your teeth, isn't it, and and trying to struggle on. I think it was Spurgeon who said, for everyone look at yourself, take 10 looks at Jesus. For everyone, look at yourself. Take ten looks at Jesus. It's not being about introspective. It's about looking at Jesus and all we have in him. I love 1 John chapter 3. It talks about setting our hearts at rest whenever our hearts condemn us. Sometimes we do that. We're conscious that we're not what we should be our hearts begin to condemn us. That ruins our love, our joy, our peace, and the fruits of the Spirit. And John says, whenever our hearts condemn us, we need to set our hearts at rest in him. So what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? 
to live in this unity with Christ. Well, I, I often help out with a messy church, and in messy church, we, I do lots of magic tricks. I often dress up as a clown. Uh, my wife tells me I dress up as a clown when I'm not doing messy church, but there we are. Um, I've got a little illustration here. I want you all to be children this morning, to be childlike. Because this is a simple illustration I've often used uh, when talking with children about Christ in me and I'm trying to live my life in Christ, being united with him, walking in the spirit. I've just got a, a bowl of water. I've got an empty jar and I see somebody smiling, they know what's coming. No? Oh, I thought you knew this one. <laughs> it's not a magic trick, it's just a very simple illustration. I'm gonna put the jar in the water without breaking it. <laughs> very simple illustration, where's the jar? The jar's in the water. Where's the water? The water's in the jar. It says it all, doesn't it? about our unity with Christ, our life in Christ, his Holy Spirit at work in us. The water is in the jar and the jar is in the water. I like to call this the grace walk, the grace friendship. We went to visit my um, brother-in-law on Saturday. That's why we couldn't come to the Thanksgiving day. Unfortunately, he's had a stroke. He's a farmer in Kent. So we went to support him and his wife. And uh, when we went, we had to go down a lane which is called Gracious Lane. And as I turned into the lane, I was praying about what to share with you today. And we turned into the lane, it said Gracious Lane in the middle of nowhere. And I thought, that's it, Gracious Lane. And I wanted to jump out and get a photograph of it for you this morning. But there was a car behind me and on the way back, there were two cars behind me and a junction, so I couldn't. Gracious Lane. Jesus calls us to live in Gracious Lane. Jesus calls us to live in Gracious Lane. Walking in the Spirit, we share his life. We choose to walk with him in the lane of his grace. When Jesus called his disciples, he just used two words, didn't he? What were they? Follow me. We often just flick over those words, follow me, but it means that Jesus was leading the way. He was calling them to be disciples, learners, if you like, is what the word means. But they had to keep their focus on Jesus. Follow me means that he was leading the way and they were following and because he walked this earth he knows our struggles he knows the rugged paths we sometimes we have to face he knows he understands and in John 10 we have that lovely picture of Jesus as the lead, the shepherd who leads his sheep who knows his sheep and they know his voice that relationship of intimate and deep trust Follow me, he leads the way. When we sit on Bexhill Beach, um, it's a bit of a struggle to get Olive because of her disability, and she won't mind me saying this, onto the beach. And sometimes it takes me and uh, our two grown up grandsons to do it. But harder than getting on the beach is getting off the beach. Because if you've seen Bexhill Beach, you've got banks like this of pebbles. Have you ever tried walking up, up a bank of pebbles? Yeah, not very easy. I have a struggle to walk up a bank of pebbles. So we've got to get back up the beach with Olive. So my sons are there struggling. I'm there pushing from the back. Not really, <laughs> but just in case. And I remember saying to Olive, look, look where your sons have put their feet because they've pressed the pebbles down. Just tread where they've trodden and you'll find how easier it is. Just tread where they've trodden, where the pebbles are all depressed, they've gone before you and you'll find the walk will become easier. 
Jesus calls, to, calls us to follow him. He knows us, he loves us, he knows where we are. But more important than that, Jesus is the one who shares our journey with us. He's there to be alongside in whatever we face. That lovely verse from Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, for, for thou art with me, for you are with me. You are with me, I will fear no evil. Do you know what the two most repeated words in the Bible are? Fear not. Just two words over and over again. Fear not. They're there because God knows we do. He wants to share the journey with us. Fear and struggle are very real to all of us at some time or other. God knows that. But he's there to lead us, he's there to walk with us, to share with us. When we lived in Pakistan, in Quetta, in the Baluchistan Mountains, in the Christian hospital, where we worked for 10 years, we would often see the shepherd leading their sheep through very deep, rugged cliffs and valleys. And especially when it was coming to winter, they were leading them down from the mountains through those dangerous valleys, and they were dangerous. And they were leading them through those dangerous valleys where there were wild beasts and there were snakes and all the rest of it, and there were robbers. And they were leading them down to where there was more pasture. That lovely picture of the shepherd who leads his sheep. And you know, that valley experience may be very real, for us sometimes. It may be very real for some of you here today or to some listening online. But you know, the key word in that verse from Psalm 23, what do you think is the key word? I'll read it again. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. What do you think is the key word? Through. The word through, it's not a dead end, is it? Even though you walk through the valley, I am with you. For me, that's a very important word. He brings us through. We are secure in his love. I just want to share with you one other thought from the time when we were in Pakistan. If you were in Anglican churches on Sunday, you would have heard the reading from Matthew 11. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and gentle in heart. And that was the verse to be read in churches. Take my yoke upon you. If we could have a picture of that on the screen, please. Take my yoke upon me and learn from me. I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, having studied theology, I thought I knew what that was all about. But we used to go to the Sin Desert, or the edge of the Sin Desert, to a place called Shikarpur, way down from the mountains, to run a mobile hospital eye hospital for two months where patients would come from the surrounding villages on bullock carts to receive operations and treatment and care. And we used to call it the bullock cart symphony because we used to wake in the morning and you'd hear the squeak of the wheels as the bullock carts were making their way to the temporary hospital camps. And it was a Cindy farmer, Christian farmer, we were talking about these words. And I thought I knew what they all meant. And he said, oh, yes, yes, that's uh, words of Jesus. And I want to explain to you what he said to me. Do you know what it means to be yoked with Jesus? And we've got a picture here of the yoke. This is how they used to arrive at our hospital. He said, if we want to train a young ox... The way we do it is to put him 
in the yoke with an old experienced ox. And the old experienced ox knows the ropes, he knows where he's going. The young ox keeps trying to go his own way, and so the yoke rubs on him. And he learns by walking in step with the old ox, the yoke becomes easy. And the more he walks in step with the old ox, the yoke becomes easy and gentle. That was a revelation to me about what it means to walk in the spirit. So I walk with Jesus, keeping close to him. And I want to close with just a simple illustration. Think of the yoke. The yoke is like this, isn't it? Over. I want you to think of the yoke as the arms of Jesus over you. Whatever your journey is at the moment, you are yoked with Jesus. His arm is over you. And he will lead you. He will never let you down. You are secure as you walk with him, walking in the spirit. I want you to close your eyes for a few seconds. We're going to sing a hymn in a moment. But I just want to read a few words which have always been very special to me. It's important you just close your eyes as I read these words as a reflection, if you like, as a, as a prayer for you this morning. There flows between his gracious spirit and my spirit an interchange of life, his life. I am in him, he is in me. There is an ongoing, continuing interrelationship whereby he imparts his life to me and takes up my little life into his. His life is imparted as a clear flowing stream from the fountain source of his own magnificent, inexhaustible self. He comes to me continuously in never-ending life to energize and invigorate me. I am his, the recipient of an ever-renewed life. He is mine to be the bestower of every good and perfect gift needed to sustain me through all eternity. I just need to remain ever open, responsive and receptive to the inflow of his life to mine. It is his life that surrounds and enfolds me on every side. In any situation, at any time, in any place, I can breathe quietly. O oh Christ, you are here. You are the ever-present one, the great I am. Live your life in me. Live your life in me. As we remain seated, we're going to just sing a hymn which is really just one verse. You are my hiding place.
I'm just going to put on the screen um, some words which are going to be on a little handout that will be given to you when you leave the chapel this morning. It's called Let Us Keep in Step with the Spirit. And it's about the call of God. And there are a few verses there. The call of God. The call of God who calls us to walk with him. To walk in the Spirit. But then there were a few verses about the promise of God. And there are more verses there that follow on. And a very, very important verse. God, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. He is your faithful God. You are united with him. He is united with you. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. I'll be going to give you that. You may want to take it with you and use it if you're staying here at Crowhurst or just take it home for further reflection and, and just allow um, the Lord to speak to you through that. But you don't have to take it. It's there if you would like. Also going to give you a little card which you can keep with the illustration of the yoke. It just simply says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Keep in step with the Spirit. It means saying yes to Jesus. It means learning to walk with him. And it means being strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I would like you to take one of those with you. Just slot it in your Bible and it's there just to help you. Let us remember that we are walking, all of us, in gracious lane. In gracious lane. So let's just be quiet for a few moments as we come to the close of our service. We are going to sing another hymn before we close. Um, and we will be saying goodbye to those who've joined us online, but there will be an opportunity after the service to come forward for prayer with anointing. And we're not going to ask you to say why you've come forward for prayer. We're just going to anoint you very simply in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit with a few words. And we just want you to receive that anointing of God. He knows where you are. He knows your needs. And he wants to minister his anointing and his love to you this day. But just a short time of quiet. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He has anointed us. He has set his seal of ownership on us. He has put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing all that is to come. It is God who makes us and you stand firm in Christ. He has anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts. So go into the world in peace, looking up to Jesus who was wounded for your sin, and bearing about in your lives the love, the joy, and the peace, which are the marks of Jesus on his disciples. Go walk with Christ in gracious lane. Amen. So our closing hymn, Let Your Living Water Flow Over My Soul. 
And then after the hymn, there will be an opportunity for you to come if you would like to receive anointing.